Good afternoon to our viewers in Germany and good morning to our viewers in the United States. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. This is the second event in a three-day symposium hosted by the American Council on Germany and the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung USA, titled Six Months into the Biden Presidency, Transatlantic Trends and Aspirations. In this session, we will focus on transatlantic defense and security policy, and I can hardly think of a better panel to address the myriad geopolitical challenges ranging from Russia and China to cybersecurity and beyond. For me, the big questions are, how can Europe and the United States get onto the same page to effectively deal with such pressing security concerns? And what will burden sharing look like in the months and years ahead? To address these questions and others, we are joined by Dr. Jana Puklirin, Dr. Tori Tausik, and Lauren Speranza. Jana has been the head of the European Council on Foreign Relations office in Berlin and a senior policy fellow since January of 2020. Before joining ECFR, she headed the Alfred von Oppenheim Center for European Policy Studies at the German Council on Foreign Relations, or the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Auswärtige Politik, or DGAP. Prior to that, she was an advisor on disarmament, arms control, and non-proliferation in the German Bundestag. Jana, herzlich willkommen. Thanks. Tori is the research director for the Project on Europe and the Transatlantic Relationship and the American Secretaries of State Project at the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center. She's also a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution's Center on the United States and Europe. Tori, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for the invitation, Steve. And Lauren will moderate today's discussion. She is the Director of Transatlantic Defense and Security at the Center for European Policy Analysis. Prior to joining SIPA, she was the Deputy Director of the Transatlantic Security Initiative at the Atlantic Council, and we'll be posting all three bios to the chat. Before I give the floor to Lauren, let me just remind our viewers that if you have a question during today's event, you can use the Q&A function in Zoom. We'll do our best to include your questions in the conversation. And with that, it's over to you, Lauren. Well, Steve, thank you so much for the kind invitation and uh, thank you for having me. Really excited for this discussion um, and thank you to everyone for, for tuning in. I'm honored to be on this session on security and defense with a, which I think Tori called a, a power frown panel, which I really appreciate. So thank you for that. Um, and I know we're in for a really rich discussion. Um, so as, as Steve sort of laid out, you know, we're about six months into the Biden administration and can actually pause, I think, to take some stock for a second. Um, we just came out of U.S. President Biden's first trip to Europe, uh, strategically important, I think, as his first international destination. And that, of course, included a NATO summit, uh, an EU-U.S. summit, a U.S.-Russia summit, and all of those had major security aspects. Um, and so I thought we could start with just a quick lightning round, maybe just a few sentences from each of you on how you would rate sort of the overall health of the transatlantic alliance compared to where we were maybe a year ago and kind of how you think the Biden administration has done so far on transatlantic security. Um, and uh, maybe Jana, we can start with you. Thank you very much, Lauren. And let me echo you uh, in kind of praising this panel. I'm super honored to be on this panel uh, with kind of two superwomen um, who, yeah, I adore very much. So um, I think this is fun. Um, so the overall health of the transatlantic relationship seen from Berlin, um, I think is a mixed picture. Um, I think we have never or hardly ever seen a more pro-European, also pro-German American administration uh, since uh, 1945. Um, I think this is crystal clear. We have seen um, a huge charm offensive from the Biden administration, especially towards Germany, but also to Europe uh, more broadly. And yeah, from a German perspective, it it seems that Biden does the exact opposite of everything that Trump has done. Um, so uh, Donald Trump had decided to withdraw thousands of troops 
from Germany, uh, Joe Biden came uh, basically to Europe with uh, 500 uh, soldiers or more as a present uh, to, to, to the Germans. Um, and also, I mean, he's not letting us off the hook when it comes to 2% defense spending, but he doesn't make it basically a golf club fee. And uh, uh, Anthony Blinken has emphasized that uh, it was not the only way to measure uh, European contributions to NATO. And, and so it's, it feels more cozy and it feels uh, warmer and, and better. Um, but at the same time, I think it also became very visible that uh, under the surface tensions remain, uh, even though there were some major breakthroughs with Airbus Boeing, but, I think fundamentally, um, it is still undecided where this relationship goes under the Biden administration. And this, and this is my last sentence very much also depends on Europe and Berlin, because I think whereas we have seen this charm offensive coming from the United States, I think the German response was rather lukewarmish. Um, so no presence. Um, so far, um, but basically the Germans got what they wanted. They pushed Nord Stream 2 through the German Chancellor personally, um, weighed him to, to try to push the investment agreement with China through. And so I think it was not really well balanced kind of when it came to enthusiasm and energy <laughs> that, that kind of went into the relationship so far. So over to Tori. Thanks, Jana. Lots of great dynamics that you put on the table that I definitely want to pick up on. Um, and Tori, would love to get your thoughts first from an American's perspective. You know, how how has the Biden administration done so far in transatlantic security? Yeah, thank you, Lauren, and thanks for the uh, opening comments, Jana. Um, you know, if I were to put transatlantic relations under the Trump administration as a kind of three point five out of ten. I think, uh, you know, in many ways we've moved up the scale. Maybe I would put it at a seven out of 10 right now. And, you know, I, I think uh, maybe I'm a bit more positive than Yana at the onset. You know, at this stage in the Biden administration, I would measure success both in, in style and in substance. And on the stylistic front, although I certainly don't think this is the, the, the core of how we will measure success going forward, but you know, a huge part, I think, of making progress in the transatlantic relationship over the coming years has to be in rebuilding the foundations of trust and confidence to begin with. Uh, this was something we laid out in an in a extensive report that we launched at Harvard with the German Council on Foreign Relations um, just on the eve of the Biden administration. And I think we have to take into account how big that uh, mountain was for, for the Biden administration coming in. And as Yana mentioned, this is a very pro-European administration, but this is also an administration that is laser focused on China and the Indo-Pacific. And given that focus, we've seen a huge amount of activity from this administration in Europe. Um, I'm not going to list all the summits, but we did have Biden's first international visit to Europe and all of the summits that came with that. We had Merkel as the first uh, visitor to the White House of the European countries. And we've seen a ton of attention on, on rebuilding the trust and confidence in this relationship, despite being laser focused on China and the Indo-Pacific. So I was pretty heartened by that. Um, but moving forward, and I guess this is where I could be a bit more critical, there's a lot of work to do and not a lot of time to do it in. Uh, you know, the administration's tagline is America is back. Um, I think Europe is right to see in, you know, the the nervous person in me thinks that this is really Biden is back and we don't have a lot of time before uh, we might see a Trump 2.0 in 2024 to accomplish a huge amount on uh, key transnational issues. So there is a lot of work to be done. We don't have a lot of time to do it, but I do think that the, the time, attention and effort that the administration has put in, in just returning to the table and taking the necessary steps to rebuilding trust and confidence um, has, been, has been heartening to see. So a lot of work to do, but I think in these first six months, they've done well at being back to the table. Thanks, Tori. That makes a ton of sense. And I think, uh, as you said, the hard work is, is in front of us. And even if you know we have taken the right steps so far in rebuilding, uh, rebuilding is not going to be enough if we can't actually move out on, on this big transatlantic agenda in front of us. So um, I wanted to pick up on uh, what you mentioned, uh, Tori, about China. And, you know, I think just as you mentioned, the focus across all of the summits and, and recent U.S. activity in Europe on China really underscores how much this has risen as a major transatlantic issue. Um, and I would be curious, I know you focus a lot on this, so maybe you could start us off with, 
you know, how would you assess the level of convergence between the United States and Europe on the security threat in particular posed by China? You know, I think we have seen a lot of a significant sea change in terms of, of starting to come together, but would be curious for your thoughts on that. And then uh, Jana would love to come to you from your perch in Berlin. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and, you know, as I mentioned, you alluded to, this is a, a key focus of the administration. Um, I think taking one step back that we've actually seen a huge amount of convergence in the European perspective and the American perspective on the challenges posed by China to the transatlantic alliance, to our interests, to our values. Um, you know, even just in the time from 2017 to today, we've seen, particularly at the EU level, a focus more on strategic competition uh, with China that was not present before. That being said, now the, the proof is in the pudding. How do we respond to these challenges? And this is where differences remain. Um, you know, I've written that a key stumbling block to transatlantic cooperation on China is going to be internal differences uh, in Europe about how to approach various challenges from China. Um, and, and this is particularly the case from the German perspective. Uh, you know, the reason that I mentioned this is kind of a mixed bag to date is because we've seen, you know, good rhetoric uh, on China coming from Berlin and even Paris and, and Brussels on what to do about the China challenge. But at the same time, we saw Merkel uh, be a key leader in pushing forward the, the Chinese EU investment agreement on the eve of the Biden administration. Uh, Chancellor Merkel has also been a, a staunch proponent on ensuring that Huawei is not banned from Germany's 5G network. So, so there is this very pro-engagement approach coming from Germany, probably more so than elsewhere in Europe hence the, the divisions we see. But, um, you know, on, on the positive side of the ledger, we do have this US-EU dialogue that was launched under the Trump administration that's continuing under the Biden administration uh, that Wendy Sherman just picked up um, in recent months. Um, we have, uh, I think we've seen coordinated actions from the US, the EU, the UK on common values like the coordinated sanctions on Xinjiang, which was positive. And what I would like to see in the, the months and, and year going forward is much stronger cooperation, particularly on the technology front. This is where I think even those in the pro-engagement camp in Germany, like Chancellor Merkel, really see uh, a challenge from Chinese you know, made in China 2025 efforts to become industrial leaders in advanced manufacturing. Um, we see kind of values challenges to democratic networks and, and systems in our own societies. And so I'd like to see us really lean in on the tech front. I think the, the US EU Trade and Technology Council is one way to do that. Um, and then final point on this, I think we should also be leaning into how we enhance our cooperation with partners in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, this is going to be key uh, in order to, to strengthen the rules-based order to push back against Chinese transgressions there. Um, and that we've also seen some progress in, in inviting uh, Indo-Pacific partners to the recent G7. So I really think we need to build this bridge between the transatlantic and the Indo-Pacific partners. And, and we have seen um, some progress there to date, but, and, and I'd be curious to hear Yana's points on this, but. European divisions on how to tackle fundamental challenges from China are going to be a big problem um, in really strengthening cooperation transatlantically in the coming year. Absolutely. And I think what, what you alluded to, Tori, is there's all of these different aspects of the China challenge. You know, there's the, the values piece, the kind of strategic balance of power. There's the military threat, which seems much further afield from Europe, I think, in the Indo-Pacific. But then there's also the challenges in the European theater, kind of in Europe's own backyard. You know, some of that is happening politically, but also, as you mentioned, on the technological side, when we talk about infiltration of networks and um, some of the hybrid challenges that we see from China, you know, that is very much happening within the alliance and in inside Europe. So um, Jana would be, be curious to hear your thoughts on how this debate looks in Berlin, but also what you see from a broader European perspective. Yeah, before I start, I need to make two footnotes to what Tori um, has said on, on the transatlantic um, relationship, because I agree that um, it's all about rebuilding and uh, regaining trust, but it's also very much about renewing. And I think here um, is where the problem starts. So it's not just getting back trust and getting back to where we've been before, but finding basically a new yeah, raison d'etre, uh, something that, that brings us together. And um, 
and here I think um, it is not yet clear how how to do this. And I mean, on the one hand, what the Europeans hear from the Americans is always you need to grow up. And I think this has really um, sunken in under the, the Trump administration. Kind of, we need to do more. We need to take care more of our own security um, and become more independent um, in a way. And I think. Although the Biden administration is much more favorable to the idea of strategic autonomy or European sovereignty or whatever, European taking up playing a bigger role, I think it is not clear how much we want to do together and how independent um, we want to become. And I just give you um, one example, like after um, Joe Biden met uh, Vladimir Putin, there was this initiative. I mean, I'm sure we come back to this from Merkel and Macron. And the reason Merkel gave for this initiative uh, for, for, for uh, kind of on, on approaching uh, Russia and suggesting an EU Putin summit was we should not simply be informed about um, the EU president's uh, talks. So it's it's the question, what kind of role is Europe playing? What kind of partnership on eye level is going to emerge? I think is, is really the crucial uh, questions. And I would very much love to see uh, a better partnership in the future. And another thing that Tori said is just, I think so important when it comes to talks in Europe and also uh, particularly in Germany is this 2024 scenario that is looming. Um, when you talk to anybody in, in Germany uh, about uh, the Biden administration, one of the first three sentences is, yeah, uh, we don't have uh, a problem right now, but who know what the future will bring. And I think what I, what I understand from my conversations is that people, it's not only about another Trump scenario, it's really the idea that the American political system might be broken. Um, and we see that also mirrored in some of our ECFR um, data when we, when we did pu public polling, it's more a crisis of American democracy. It's the capital riots and all this that make the uh, kind of European publics deeply skeptical uh, about uh, yeah, the American democracy. So I think this is should not be under underestimated because it's as if I think on this transatlantic relationship as that, that gives or creates the uh, atmosphere as if somebody was always kind of um, pulling the brake while driving at the same time, because this is Kind of a balancing act we need to prepare for a, a trump 2 scenario but at the same time engage with the biden administration this is i think what what comes across very often but coming back to china i echo everything that tori has said i think she's exactly um right so from a, a european perspective i think the eu has coined this phrase of china being a partner a competitor and a systemic uh, rival but i think the extent um to 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 uh, or the prior, prioritization of these three categories in Europe varies greatly. So some countries emphasize partnership and some countries uh, emphasize China being the competitor or the um, systemic rival. And even within the countries, like giving you a glimpse um, uh, on our election campaign right now, even within Germany, um, kind of the, the green candidate Baerbock puts her emphasis on the rival, systemic rival part, whereas Laschet <laughs> very often when he talks about China mentions partner and competitor and completely forgets uh, to talk about the systemic rival. That has happened, I think, uh, two or three times already in interviews. Um, so Tori is right. It's really about um, getting a united European front on China. And I think part of the American charm offensive towards Germany is also the idea that Germany could bring the other Europeans. Um, but uh, let's not forget that we have an election campaign ongoing. Um, we will have uh, elections at the end of September, um, and then we will have French elections uh, in May. So Tori's argument about having limited amount of time, I think, is is is, is really true. Also, when it comes to to the European um, partners and. So um, last remark on, on China, um, I think there is uh, a lot of convergence and growing convergence on, on China, I think, in Europe um, and the United States. Lithuania has just left the 17 plus one uh, initiative. Um, and so I think there is growing convergence and there are also, also Germany is changing. So the German business um, industry has become a more and more critical uh, of China. Um, people are more and more aware that kind of, it's not only a business opportunity, but also a huge challenge and a threat. 
But, I mean, looking at the election campaign again, um, the Merkel camp, basically, um, engagement first camp is still very strong within the CDU. And Armin Laschet is basically the reincarnation of the Merkel approach. And it, it will be very interesting to watch a new German government if it consists the Green Party and uh, kind of a, a CDU chancellor. Um, I think changes in the air, but it's not as clear cut um, as, as I think many Americans would, would wish. Um, so there are strong forces in Germany that think that we haven't done so bad uh, in the last, I don't know, 10 to 15 years. And maybe we can just continue to sit on the fence and not uh, become basically a part in that big power competition between the US and China. So um, I think there is a lot of work to do um, still. Thanks, Jana. It's, it's really fascinating to hear. And I think your point about kind of this notion that Europe wants to play a more independent role in this kind of tug of war that's happening between, you know, kind of being informed of US policies and trying to, to string along versus having a more independent, perhaps European policy towards China is playing out um, in the China debate, too. And I wanted to pick up on the, the point that you made about Russia. I mean, it's I think it's so interesting now that we start these panel discussions with China as the first topic as opposed to Russia, which has traditionally been at the forefront of, of the transatlantic security agenda. And, um, you know, we've seen a couple of things recently that have just really, um, I think, called into question, you know, we can't. It reminded us that we cannot afford to under-prioritize the Russia challenge. You know, we've seen um, continued aggressive behavior from Russia in the Black Sea region, um, the military buildup recently near the, the Ukrainian border. You know, we have this big Zapad military exercise coming up. And then, of course, all of the stuff that happens under the kind of Article 5 threshold on cyber and election interference and all of these things. And, and I'd love to come to, to cyber more specifically in a second. But firstly, on the broader Russia challenge. I mean, how how can we strike the right balance between the Russia and the China challenge and really keep the fire going on the military challenge posed by Russia in Europe, especially when it seems that the U.S. administration now kind of wants to park the Russia issue to go off and, and deal with a variety of other issues, including in the Indo-Pacific. And, and maybe Tori, you can take that part of the question. And, and Jana, you know, I think it would be helpful to hear from you, even allies within Europe still diverge on how to approach Russia. So how, how can we get a transatlantic approach to Russia right? Uh, and maybe Tori, I can come to you first. Right, uh, there's a lot there. And, and Lauren, you're certainly an expert on these Russia issues. Um, as well. So I'd love to hear your, your points on this. But, you know, that was one of my takes uh, going into the, the Biden-Putin summit was, you know, we kept hearing from the, the administration that, that they want, the U.S. wants this stable and predictable relationship with Russia. And in my mind, that's okay, so we can focus on China in the Indo-Pacific and, and say what we need to say to Russia, have Europe take a stronger role in its own neighborhood, and, and for lack of a better word, pivot elsewhere. Um, but Russia is not going away. I think Russia is viewed as a major strategic challenge by the United States. Um, and in that sense, you know, I've kind of come around to the idea post-summit that, that this was important an important conversation to have in its own right uh, for Biden to articulate directly to Putin where America's own red lines are, uh, how America will seek to push back on those red lines, particularly on the cyber front and, and cyber attacks on, on critical in industry in the United States. Um, and also on, on arms control. You know, we barely have any functioning arms control treaties left in the U.S.-Russia space. And so it was important to have these conversations and develop stability in an existential uh, area for the U.S. and Russia and for Europe. Um, so that was important in its own right, despite the fact that um, the United States needs to be committing more resources to the Indo-Pacific. Um, what I worry with, and I'd be curious to hear both of your points on this, is on the cyber front and in Biden laying out these red lines, um, you know, I was kind of immediately concerned about what this means going next uh, or coming out of this. Um, you know, if you talk to Russia experts, 
who really focus on cyber crime emanating from the Russian territory, they will say that there actually is a fair amount of control that the Kremlin, Kremlin can exert over these groups and that if Putin says to these groups, shut it down, they'll shut it down. Um, and that therefore Biden articulating these red lines could be effective. But I worry about the case when that's when that's not true and that Putin either decides not to shut these groups down or they start to act more autonomously. And therefore, what offensive measures we might see on the horizon going forward and what Europe's response would be, should we start to see more um, offensive cyber activity from the United States directed towards these criminal groups? Um, I'm not a cyber expert. That's why I'd be very curious to hear your perspectives on, on these issues. But I think we're entering a territory where we might start to see more offensive measures used um, from both sides in the cyber front. And I'm curious what, what that will look like now that these red lines have been have been laid out. Thanks, Troy. There's certainly a lot to pick up on there, especially on the cyber point. But I, I wonder, Jana, if you have some thoughts. I mean, obviously, the the uh, intra-European divisions on kind of how to approach Russia is not a new issue, of course. But I think it's interesting how it's playing out now as we have a new administration in the U.S. So I don't know if you have thoughts on kind of how how do we kind of corral uh, allies in Europe around the, the Russia challenge and how to get that approach right. And then I would love to dive a little more into the cyber question after that. Maybe a few remarks on Russia and also uh, with regard to China, because um, what I have observed uh, in recent conversations throughout the past, I would say two years, is that um, where kind of while in the United States, a lot of people talk about China and Russia as a joint security threat and have different scenarios in mind, uh, kind of a, a, a joint attack um, coordinated, basically two fronts, uh, Taiwan and something in Central and Eastern Europe that is not very much on the on the Europeans radar, um, I have to say, oh, that is not kind of front and center of our conversations. We had conferences on uh, Russia and China and uh, and how they uh, cooperate with each other. Um, but I think we are a bit behind um, when it when it comes to identifying um, this as a, as a joint threat. Um, but although, I mean, of course, um, people are working on this, but it's just not as common to talk about this or to think about this as I, I think it is um, in the United States. So what I think a lot of uh, Europeans think about it is that Russia remains uh, the prior security threat to Europe um, and China is a security threat, but a different one. So Russia is clearly a task for NATO, um, kind of deterrence and defense, um, uh, NATO's eastern flank, and that is also from a Berlin perspective, very important to keep focus on that. Um, not ignoring the China challenge and also making this uh, a NATO topic, um, but not to the same level. So when I, I for example, um, some people in Europe are wondering whether basically this is the American idea behind all of this to basically turn NATO into an anti-China alliance. And um, there is huge pushback uh, in some European countries uh, when it comes to that. So, um, and, and, and also when it comes to the challenge, I think China, the China challenge is, it's, is from a German perspective, much less seen as a kind of military security challenge or a military threat challenge and more a general security challenge uh, when it comes to yeah, critical infrastructure, um, cyber, um, but, and, and also kind of, yeah, kind of the, the um, 17 plus one, the idea to split the Europeans and all this, but Russia is seen as a military threat or the, a much more important or much more urgent threat from, from I think, um, at least from Berlin's perspective and Central and Eastern European, Northern European um, perspective. So that's why I think um, the Biden's trip to, to Europe and the discussions within NATO have been very successful from a European perspective, because I think there was this very delicate balance um, um, and, and, and we, there was um, uh, kind of uh, some, some, some uh, how the China challenge was phrased, I think was, uh, was very much um, 
uh, approved um, in Berlin. So when it comes to, to Russia more broadly, um, the, the problem is that, yeah, as you have said, Lauren, there are different um, takes in, in Europe. And I actually thought that after the Borel disaster in Moscow, that something good would come out of it uh, because the EU uh, countries suddenly were more united than ever and Borel has changed course. And so he had prepared this paper and everything was very tough and then, <laughs> And, and Macron, in my eyes, had burned himself already because of yeah, NATO brain dead and because his idea of a reset with Russia was basically torpedoed by all the other Europeans. But then, uh, I mean, right before uh, the EU summit, where also Borrell's paper was supposed to be discussed, um, Merkel and Macron came up with that initiative. And I mean, just watching the reactions to this idea um, and, and, and watching the Europeans fight like cats and dogs over this uh, proposal gives you an idea how, uh, yeah, how diverse uh, the approach um, currently is. I think there is an awareness in, in Europe that basically the United States is focusing more and more on the Indo-Pacific and it will be on the Europeans uh, to be the backbone of NATO when it comes to conventional uh, deterrence and defense, uh, at least, and that we need to do more and step up and I think now the task or the challenge is to find a right balance because it cannot be that the Europeans focus only basically on Russia and the Americans focus on China. There are a lot of people worried saying this is decoupling. Uh, we need to do both together, but how to find the right mix and balance is discussed differently in different European um, capitals. There are some that say, well, let's do some cosmetic stuff in the Indo-Pacific militarily, but heavy uh, lifting is on, on the United States and we don't basically duplicate our efforts and others say, no, but we need to do much more kind of substantive presence in the Indo-Pacific. And yeah, so I think these are the debates we are uh, going to have in the future. Absolutely. And I think it was really interesting that the that the UK kind of chose Russia as the, the preeminent challenge in some of its recent strategy documents, too. But Tori, I know you wanted to come in with a quick point on the, the Russia-China balance here. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I, I wanted to follow up on what Jana was saying about this, how NATO strikes a balance between focusing on its proximate, uh, long-term strategic threat of Russia versus this kind of uh, rising strategic challenge of China. Um, it, Yana made a very good point about the difference between American and European perspectives on how NATO should view China and the military challenges from China. And I think I'm going to echo that, that American um, division here. But I, I think she's absolutely right that the conversations happening in Europe and the US are very different on this front. You know, I often hear, even from senior uh, administration officials, how genuinely concerned they are about the growing coordination, particularly on the military front from Russia and China, to the extent that I was even surprised um, by, by how seriously they're looking at, at this uh, relationship and this concern. So I, so I definitely think this growing, we might even call partnership, even if never you know, codified, um, is how seriously it's taken by the administration. That's one. And then the second is um, you know, how often in conversations we do hear about the potential for, if not in the near term, perhaps in the medium term, of, of what uh, dual security crises in the Indo-Pacific and in Eastern Europe or Central Europe could look like um, and how the transatlantic would respond, transatlantic alliance would respond should we see China take action in the Taiwan Straits at the same time that Russia uses that distraction to pursue its own endeavors. Um, something I hear often in U.S. conversations that's interesting to hear. It doesn't perhaps come up as much in in, in European conversations. But that was one point. A final point on how NATO should be incorporating the challenge from China. Um, you know, I, I don't think, as Yana mentioned, it's likely at all that we're going to see NATO focus more on the Indo-Pacific. But I do think that there are very concrete ways that China is presenting real security challenges to the alliance closer to home. One is in Chinese investments in critical industries and technologies. As Yana mentioned, that is going to be fundamentally important. NATO is paying attention to that. The second that we that I don't think comes up as much, but that is also 
really important is the investments and modernization that China is making in its nuclear arsenal and how it is not bound by any uh, arms control treaties in its own ballistic missile programs uh, in the way that that the US and Russia try to maintain some sort of stability. So that's another. And then the the third piece that I think NATO is paying more attention to that, that Yana mentioned is on the cyber front and also on the disinformation front where China is presenting uh, very real challenges to uh, you know Article Two uh, issues within the alliance and alliance uh, democratic values, and so I, I was heartened to see coming out of the NATO summit this greater focus on China, even if this was you know quietly or loudly pushed by the United States. Um, but I think for very real reasons and important reasons, uh, it has done so on the security and military front. And I have a two finger on this because I, I completely um, agree, and I think kind of the balance that was found um, during the last NATO summit was really approved on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, but I mean, the moment um, everybody agreed, Macron basically put it all into a perspective again, into his own perspective again. But I think what he said back then echoes very much the German approach as well, because he basically um, yeah, um, he says, yeah, NATO needs to focus on China, but there are within limits basically and and i think what what a, a european um, approach now is is really to increase the cooperation with like-minded partners in the um in the pacific and i i think that is something where the us and europe can work together um as well um to 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 work with uh, third partners and maybe also to to um, to, to have a certain amount of work share or to let the Europeans maybe do some stuff that the Americans cannot do um, that well. But when it comes to yeah, dealing with um, not only Japan, but um, yeah, Australia, uh, also um, other, other um, partners in, in the region, um, when it comes to equipping them and working with them, this has been the focus also of the German uh, Indo-Pacific strategy or has been part of, of this and the EU um, strategy. So I think this will be an important angle of our transatlantic cooperation, kind of our joint cooperation with uh, countries in the region that are not China. Right. Absolutely. No. And it's fascinating to hear the differences and the nuances of the debate about Russia and China and how it looks from, from an American perspective and a European perspective. So thank you both for, for teasing that out. Um, I think we've kind of been been dancing around the, the cyber issue, and I think this is one of the areas where the Russia and the China threat kind of both come to to play. And, you know, we saw recently just the Microsoft Exchange attacks and and kind of how that was attributed to to China and um, China related actors. But then also we've seen a lot of recent cyber attacks from from Russia. And if we look at the, the pipeline attack in the U.S., but but also this kind of ongoing set of campaigns that we see from cyber espionage to cyber crime to election interference to just general undermining of critical infrastructure and, and infiltrating networks. And I think we saw at all of the summits recently, this kind of focus on the, the concept of resilience and building resilience to these types of challenges. Now, resilience can mean, of course, a million different things and play out in a bunch of different contexts, but specifically resilience of, of networks and infrastructure to these types of below threshold um, attacks has been, you know, really gaining a lot of momentum in the transatlantic debate. And you know, as Tori alluded to earlier, I think we are now starting to see some momentum in terms of trying to actually call out these attacks when they happen, attribute them when we can, and take preventative measures, you know, building resilience to try and mitigate the fallout and the effects of some of these attacks. But I, my personal take is, and I'd be curious to hear, hear your thoughts, and Tori alluded to some of this already, but um, that this doesn't go far enough. I mean, these actions are part of these widespread ongoing campaigns that are only going to continue to escalate. And as we've seen, you know, we know we all know Putin likes to try and push the envelope to see how much we can get away with before there are actually consequences. So and one of our viewers has has alluded to just this, saying that, you know, we have actually, as the transatlantic community, kind of stopped short of taking concrete punitive measures for these types of actions, bar maybe sanctions. Um but how how should this you know how should we tackle this as the transatlantic community going forward? I mean, is this 
a place where NATO and the EU can be doing more together? Is this a place where we should be being more proactive rather than just responding and, um, you know, tackling this attack here and this attack there? I, my personal take is that this requires a much more coordinated, comprehensive and proactive approach, which of course is difficult to implement in reality. Um, but is there appetite for that? I mean, when we talk about cyber offense, for example, you know, everyone kind of gets uncomfortable and especially in the NATO context, you know, NATO is a defensive alliance, of course, but these actions are already taking place against the transatlantic community. So how much is it really offensive um, in the first place? Would just be curious to hear both of your thoughts on that. Um, and, and maybe, Yana, we can start with you from the European perspective. It's interesting um, because while you were um, speaking, I just um, wrote down hybrid center of excellence in Helsinki because, um, I mean, you, you told us about the threat, but my point um, would be that this is also uh, in a certain way an opportunity because um, that is one of the areas where I absolutely think that EU and NATO could do uh, much more together. And given um, the fact that this is so complicated, um, and, and uh, that everything is classified. I think this model of the hybrid center of excellence in Helsinki is a good one kind of to have basically uh, EU member states um, or, EU, or European member states, NATO member states participating um, and, and working together in a rather flexible um, environment, I think um, is, 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 uh, is a good one. Um, offensive cyber uh, capacities or capabilities is, I think, a tough one um, in uh, in a German context. Um, so, the, um, yeah, um, I mean, the, Annalena Baerbock always um, emphasizes that the new threat is in in coming from from cyber uh, when she is forced to talk about two percent, and she says, "Yeah, two percent is a thing of the past, and now let's all focus on on cyber." Um, but I think she's not really thinking about offensive cyber uh, capabilities here. And sometimes in the German debate, I have the impression that if you talk about cyber like this, like this is NATO uh, in the kind of 21st century and let's all focus on cyber, this is also um, a way to um, divert attention or to kind of to, 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 to find an excuse not to spend 2% and to invest also um, kind of in, in hard um, security. Um, so I think the mentality of, uh, the approach uh, is, is different in, in Europe and the United States. Whereas, uh, and, and again, it's, it's not all the Europeans. Um, it's some European countries more reluctant than others. And I would see Germany more uh, in the reluctant um, camp, having uh, problems to warm up to, to, to the idea. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. And and Tori, I know you already shared some of your thoughts on kind of cyber offense and where this is going. And, and I realize we only have about 15 minutes left. So maybe I can keep us moving and, and um, cover a couple other topics that I know folks are eager to get to. And and Yana, what you were just mentioning about 2% and kind of what counts in that, I think brings us to this, this issue of burden sharing, which Steve also mentioned in the introduction. And I think, as you mentioned, the U.S. has sort of under... President Biden indicated an openness to taking a more sophisticated approach to burden sharing and that yes, 2% is not the only metric that we can use to measure everyone's contributions to NATO and to collective defense. And we also, you mentioned a little bit about NATO EU cooperation. I think there's almost this new opening um, in how we might leverage the EU on, especially on some of these issues like cyber to play a stronger role in, in collective defense um, in a way that perhaps doesn't undermine NATO, but reinforces it. Um, and um, Tori, I'd be curious in your perspective, your perspective on what should modern kind of burden sharing arrangement between the US and Europe look like? Thanks, Lauren. Um, Jana is, is the real expert on, on European strategic autonomy and, and defense capabilities. So I'm, I'm curious to hear you know, what steps she thinks the, the EU uh, needs to take, particularly in cooperation with NATO and strengthening its own capabilities. But what I will say from the American perspective is, you are absolutely right that this administration um, is is open to viewing burden sharing more than the, I think Yana said earlier, kind of the, the golf club membership 2% um, metric, even though the 2% is fundamentally important. And we've heard this administration talk about that. Um, it does get back to 
how allies are going to invest in their strengths and invest in innovation and cyber capabilities, not just on machinery and money for money's sake. Um, so that is important. Um, but from a more kind of to take a step back from the burden sharing conversation, this is also an administration that is open to, I think, embracing the even the concept of, of EU strategic autonomy. Um, you know, I heard administration officials before going into the administration that, you know, the idea of strategic autonomy is fine, even despite the, the fact that the rhetoric may rub people the wrong way. Um, you know, I think the, the focus on capabilities is more appreciated, but I think that the U.S. would like to see a more capable and strong partner in Europe. And that means going beyond, Lauren, as you mentioned, the 2%. Um, what I worry about is that even if you have a United States that, you know, in rhetoric and in partnership supports, um, enhanced capabilities, EU strategic autonomy, it then comes down to divisions within the European Union and within NATO member states about what that means and who pulls what kind of weight um, in achieving that enhanced capabilities. So again, I think even if we have a strong American support for something like strategic autonomy, enhanced capabilities, this is really a question um, for Europe uh, in that sense. And so kind of with that, I, I, I hand it over to Jana. I've just, I've, I, again, I've heard, time and time again that that the U.S. supports a, a stronger partner in Europe. Oh, and the final point I'll make on this is, and, and I should have mentioned this in my opening remarks, but what I would have liked to see from this administration earlier is what it wants in Europe rather than what it wants from Europe and in partnership with Europe. You know, we hear Biden time and time again say, I would like to see a Europe, we believe in a Europe that is whole free and at peace. We need to go beyond that to, as Jana mentioned, renew this partnership and move it to addressing the challenges of today and tomorrow. Um, burden sharing is a key part of this, but having, this is what I'd like to hear the administration say more, having a strong and capable, and even if that means autonomous Europe, I think is in America's interests. Um, and with that, I think we should be elaborating what our goals in Europe are. Um, more saliently. But but with that, I, I hand it over to Yana for what that looks like in Europe. So um, I think however you call uh, the baby, whether you call it strategic autonomy or European sovereignty, I think the idea behind is to, yeah, to, to get, um, to get the Europeans um, to, to, to become able to take care of their own security uh, a bit more. And I think um, that is still, I mean, this is widely understood and I think this is where everybody in Europe agrees, but there are uh, there's a lot of disagreement um, what this means in practice and exactly on this idea, um, I, I think the transatlantic relationship um, yeah, is decisive. So that all the, all the debates we have in Europe about strategic autonomy are at the very end also uh, debates about um, our uh, transatlantic relationship um, because it, it all always comes down to the question, um, should we uh, rely on the United States to be basically our, our kind of, yeah, uh, final security guarantee? Um, and there are some countries that are fine with that and others that think we need to move on. And um, yeah, you basically have, have these two camps and I think this dynamic is very toxic and we have not overcome this. And I think that's why I'm, I'm, I was so happy to see the Biden administration now basically um, embracing this idea of strategic autonomy because I think it could work um, that way. Uh, I think that the Trump administration's approach just to um, torpedo everything that had strategic autonomy on it was not really helpful for, for um, I mean, more countries spend 2%, but in the end, I think we weren't really a more capable actor. And I think the idea to do it jointly uh, in a way is a very good one. So I, I, I hope that uh, this EU idea now, this project of the strategic compass where the EU uh, sits down for the first time to really agree, I mean, they already agreed um, basically on, on threats <laughs> that they share or that they kind of, it's, it's basically, it's not a priority list, it's a list. So they, they listed all threats, but, but now they have these four baskets they are working on. They work on um, capability development, they work on partnership, they work on resilience, and they work basically on, on, on crisis management missions and operations. And although there is a big risk that this could end up as just another paper tiger, uh, I'm, I'm not entirely 
uh, without hope that that something will come out of this. Um, because more and more um, voices say that we need to align this closely with the, the NATO strategic um, concept uh, process. And that, for example, when it comes to capability developments, I mean, EU is not doing uh, territorial defense. That is a hard no. But for example, that countries start thinking of, okay, we can maybe procure or develop stuff within an EU framework that could then also um, be useful uh, to NATO. Um, kind of this kind of thinking is where I, I see the biggest um, yeah, uh, hope for, for, for progress. And when it comes to burden sharing, I think it's not about 2%, but I think that a lot of, like in this election campaign, again, a lot of people are fooling themselves when they say, yeah, but the 2% metric is, is, is not really a good one. I mean, that, that might be true, but if Europe is serious about defending uh, itself, then I think it will not cost only 2%, but maybe it might cost more than 2%. So, um, and that is where I think, Europe really needs to, to speed up um, developments when it comes to strategic enablers, for example. Um, so stuff that, yeah, we, that we cannot do without the United States, even in our own backyard, even counterterrorism operations in Africa. So I think that is where we need to decrease dependency to become a better partner. Uh, and I think the challenge for the Europeans is to, at the same time, yet yeah, to do stuff that enhances their uh, yeah, autonomy, um, independence, but that makes them a better partner at the same time. Um, but then both sides need to agree what one would want to do together and what each side can do apart. And I think here is, the, here starts the kind of tricky area. Right. Right. And hopefully we'll see, as you as you mentioned, some some of that debate playing out as we go through this NATO 2030 process and the development of the next strategic concept, which hopefully I think will support um, stronger NATO EU cooperation. And, and some of those debates will play out as as we develop the EU strategic compass, as you mentioned, um, as well. And, and we can draw those those synergies between those two processes. Um, well, I know we are we are nearly out of time, but I wanted to. Um, ask a question because this burden sharing debate relates to this underlying principle of allied cohesion and, and cohesion within the alliance, which is the backbone you know, of, of the success of the alliance. And a big part of that cohesion these days is being affected by this debate about shared values. And I think under the Biden administration in particular, but I think this is, is largely shared, especially in the European debate, um, the importance of the values that that NATO holds dear and that that it rests upon. And as as I think you mentioned earlier, Tori, you know, we're starting to see, yes, of course, these external challenges from Russia and China to the alliance's shared values of, of democracy and human rights. But some of those challenges are also manifesting within the alliance, uh, which is no secret. You know, as we as we look at places like Hungary and Turkey to a different extent, some of the uh, uh, recent events that we've seen in Georgia and Ukraine, there are issues there um, on the values front. So we've seen some developments about kind of how to um, create an ideal standard for, and reinforce these principles. Um, but how do we actually go about enforcing that? You know, there's been a big debate over or how to approach this within the alliance and if this is even within the remit of the alliance, because it gets so political so quickly. Um, so, Tori, I know you focus a lot, a lot on values. So maybe a quick word from you on this. Thanks, Lauren. And, and I very much agree. And I'm happy that you you framed it in the, the, this question of values in the sense of alliance cohesion, um, because I see democratic backsliding within the transatlantic alliance as a fundamental threat to alliance cohesion and also to security. Um, and, and just to bring up one example of why this is the case, I mean, we do see increased Russian influence and interference in countries that are backsliding democratically within our alliance. It's kind of like the way that, that Russia gets its nose under the tent of, of um, alliance cohesion and conversations. We've seen this play out with Hungary and Ukraine issues, but we could go into that further. So just to to put a final point on that, I do see democratic backsliding as a challenge to, to cohesion that the alliance does need to take seriously. What do we do about it? 
Um, this might be controversial, but I think what the you know far end of the spectrum actions could look like that I actually think might be most effective um, is by conditioning NATO security investment funds and EU financial support on uh, maintaining uh, clearly held democratic standards and calling out countries such as Hungary, Poland, and, and Turkey in, in their own ways for backsliding on some of these principles. Um, have we experienced certain backsliding in the United States? Absolutely. Um, have we recognized this? Yes. But I still think we need to stand strong on these foundations within our alliance. And by putting forward actions such as that as ways to roll back authoritarian tendencies. Um, so that's one. And then the final point I'd make on this, uh, and this is very much keeping in line with how the administration frames democracy issues, but the way that Biden talks about this competition between democ democratic and authoritarian states today is in ensuring that democracies can deliver for their citizens better than authoritarian states can. This is how we fundamentally win the next century. And I think a lot of the administration's domestic and foreign policy agenda is based around this idea of delivery. And something I've um, kind of looked at very positively to date has been on the administration's focus on anti-corruption and on pursuing an anti-kleptocratic agenda. I think there's a lot of space for the transatlantic alliance to lean into this agenda. And I hope we see a lot of US European cooperation on things like counter uh, uh, money laundering endeavors and anti-corruption more broadly. So I think if we are to focus on democracy being able to deliver, uh, this is a big part of the agenda where there's a lot of room for progress. Thanks, Tori. And, and Yana, maybe I could ask you just to close. I know we've got only a minute left here, but if you could add a slight spin to that at how you see this all playing out um, from the German lens in particular, with the German elections on the horizon, I, one of our viewers was saying, you know, there's a lot to do um, in the transatlantic agenda and on, on burden sharing, on, on values, but how, how do we move forward with this, with the the German elections on the horizon. Uh, maybe you could give us your kind of swan song here with, with where you think the relationship is heading. Yeah, maybe just um, kind of that echoing Tori again, I think um, everything she's said on values um, I share and especially also the um, the idea to cooperate more and on anti-corruption and all this, I think there is um, a big mutual interest. And here again, I think it's not, um, we should not leave this to NATO. I think we cannot solve most of this within NATO, but we have other fora we can use, especially um, the EU. I know that the EU's track record with uh, kind of, um, yeah, uh, rule of law violations within <laughs> kind of the EU has not been um, great. Um, it's to a certain extent, it has been a toothless tiger, but just um, today the EU Commission announced a kind of, or publishes um, a report on, on, on rule of law um, and violations, basically. And so with the new budget, um, um, I mean, there, there is this mechanism um, that ties rule of law and, and violations uh, of democratic standards to funding. And I think it just, uh, it, it, it takes, um, a little effort, um, but I think there are ways to deal with this. And so there are other fora we could use. We can um, work in an EU context. We can also work bilaterally. Um, so, um, and, and also uh, on Turkey, I think we cannot all solve this uh, through NATO, but we, uh, but in the, uh, through the EU, or bring the EU on board. Um, I think um, this, this could be helpful. And on the German election campaign, Look, um, I mean, four years ago, um, I thought this was a boring election campaign and the outcome was pretty clear, but then it basically took forever to form um, a German government and the first attempt was not fruitful. And I, I fear, um, uh, I think a, a similar scenario is, can be pretty um, likely um, as it stands today. Um, I mean, um, the, the green wave basically has ended. Um, so or the greens are, are grounded again. They lost more than, um, yeah, they, they lost, uh, I think, um, so they are back at 18%. They had been polling at 25% um, a while ago. And while there was this window of opportunity where I thought that there was kind of appetite for change in Germany, I think that window is closed now. Um, but, um, it can well be that we need for the first time basically three um, parties, um, three different um, 
or four if you count the CDU and the CSU as two parties involved in, in the German government. And this uh, has happened on the Länder level, but never on the federal level. So this would be a first. Um, and I, I, I'm just afraid that basically we will have the German election campaign and then it will take forever to form that government <laughs> and then the French go into election uh, mode. And so I, that has been the, the European disease for quite a while now that um, foreign policy is decided uh, on the domestic um, level um, and that the challenges on the domestic level were so um, big that there was like leaders, even like Draghi or like, um, yeah, like Macron, uh, not really had a free hand also on the on the kind of foreign policy front because they had so little support also domestically and basically their political systems were collapsing. So I, I don't see the German political system uh, collapsing or changing, but I see us um, possibly uh, too much focused on overcoming the COVID crisis recovery, um, now the flood disaster. And, and so foreign policy is not playing a big role, like always in the election campaign. But I mean, also in the last negotiation for the coalition treaty, it has not played such a big role. I hope there will be change and it will be better. But I think the reflexes are not, I mean, I, yeah, hope is limited that <laughs> <laughs> that there will be this energy coming from Berlin pretty soon, uh, right after September. Sure. Maybe that was too negative now. I'm, I, I'm still hopeful that we will see some change and some new spirit and energy, especially on China, actually. My personal That's hope. That's great. Well, a limited hope is still an okay note to end on. So uh, we'll be we'll be practical here. But thank you so much for that. And thank you both for the great conversation. I'll hand it back to Steve uh, to close us out. Thank you, Lauren. And just a huge thanks to all three of you, um, Jana, Tori, Lauren, this has been great. Uh, I certainly hope that it's no one's swan song when it comes to the three of you, because I really look forward to continuing the conversation with all of you. Uh, this has been um, truly enlightening, thoughtful and thought provoking. And I thought that um, all three of you really covered a lot of issues with a, a great deal of, of nuance. Um, when I think about the variety and the gravity of the common security threats that face Europe and the United States, listening to all of you talk about how important collaboration is to address those threats and address those challenges gives me some hope that we'll find a path forward, particularly since you also um, gave some really good suggestions, um, some steps for how to address those challenges. You didn't just list the challenges. So I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. On behalf of the ACG and the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung USA, I want to thank all three of you for, for taking the time to have this conversation with us. Um, I certainly learned a lot, and, uh, and I hope that our viewers did as well. For our viewers, let me just remind you, that later today, um, we will continue our joint symposium with uh, three experts who will talk about climate policy. And tomorrow we will have sessions on infrastructure as well as transatlantic trade and investment. But for now, my big thanks to Lauren, Yana and Tori for really kicking us off today with a, a fantastic discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs>